David said, I was young, but now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I've left God because in 62 years I can say the same thing. I'll say it like this. God is always made away. Maurice, when you spend the time in the abandoned building in Chicago, you said you go to the trash cans and there's always some food in there to eat. And you said at night you had a tool, you go and open up the fire hydrant and always had some water. It might not be the ideal meal, but God always has made sure that he's taken care of us. And I bless his name. I bless his name for that. He said, I haven't seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed that God even looks out for your children. Yeah. If you do what's right, that's the reason why God has looked out for yours. And again, we bless his name for all that he's done, all that he's doing and what he's going to do. I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 15.
I know that's right. A couple of years ago, we used that in, in the pastors and leaders camp. Each day before I spoke, I had them to grab their Bible. And I want you to grab your Bible and hold it up and say, this is my Bible. 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses from Aleph to Tau, Alpha to Omega, A to Z. I want you to say that last line. It is the story of Jesus Christ. Give him, give him a hand praise. First Chronicles 15, and David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. I'm dropping down verse 12, and said unto them, ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after due order. So the priest and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. Somebody say that according to the word of the Lord. Father, we say thank you for your word. I pray that you use these lips of clay. Father, speak a word to bless this your people. And God, allow your word to fall upon good ground. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This year, the focus is on the word of God and on his name. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about a king by the name of Josiah. Josiah was one who began to reign when he was eight years old. When he took the throne, idolatry was prevalent in Israel. But Josiah had determined, had determined that he was going to do the Bible thing the Bible way. He'd already ordered that we've got to clean up the house. We've got to sanctify the house of God. And then when they were cleaning the house, the
the Bible said that they found the book of Moses in the house of God. And it was given to Shaphan, the scribe, to read. And that's so sad that in the house of God, the word of God was lost. You would have thought that the word of God would be the central focus in the house of God. But the book was lost in the house. That's no different than the way it's been in our day and time. Because folks get in the pulpit and preach everything but the word of God. And God is not pleased with being a stranger in his own house. But this is God's house. And this is about him. Somebody say thank you Jesus. They find the book. And they give it to Shaphan, and he reads the book. What he reads in the book is alarming to him. And so he goes to Josiah and reads it to Josiah. And Josiah tears his clothes, and he repents. Because when they read the book, they found out how far they had deviated from the word of God. Traditions crept in. People's ideologies crept in. Their own thoughts of how they should do it crept in. And Josiah heard the word of God. And the Bible said he repented and he was blessed by God because he determined in his mind and not just in his mind but in his kingdom that we're going to do this thing right. His grandfather, if you will, Hezekiah, we talked about him who had something to negotiate with God about. When the prophet Isaiah came to Hezekiah and said, get your house in order, you're about to die. The Bible said Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and said to God, remember how I walked with you. I was upright, God. I did it the Bible way. And as he began to pray to God, negotiating with God on the basis of the word of God, before Isaiah makes it out of the middle court, the Bible said God told him, go back and tell Hezekiah, I've heard your prayer. And I just added 15 more years to your life. And it's all because you did it the Bible way. Somebody go ahead and give God a hand. I wanted to teach for about 45 minutes first, but I think we're about ready to end this. Maybe we'll pick it up on Tuesday, but Josiah, an eight-year-old boy, purposes, I'm going to do it right. I want some children who haven't even made it to their teen years yet to stand up with your Bible in your hand and lift that Bible up to God and say, God, I'm going to do it right. 
Come on, whoa, stay up. Don't, don't sit down yet. I want you to get militant with it. Get an attitude with God. And say, there isn't but one way to right. Say, one way is right. And it's written in the book. And I'm going to do it right. Somebody give God a praise. Come on. Somebody from teens to 30 years old. Get your Bible in your hand and stand if you mean it. Teens all the way up to 30. Lift your sword up to heaven and tell God, I'm going to do it right. Tell him, I'm holding right in my hand and I'm going to do it right. Did, now, the ones that are standing beside him, did they convince you? They sound like they was talking about a, you know, Dr. Zeus. Our nursery rhyme. But I'm serious. I want somebody to get an attitude and say, I know what's right. Say, I'm holding right in my hand and I'm going to do it right. There's only one way that's right. I'm going to do it right. Be seated. Somebody over 30 that's been through something. <laughs> Hold on. Does somebody hear a different sound? Hold on, let me take a pause real quick. Y'all stay up, but in the days of Ezra, when they were rebuilding the temple, and the Bible said the young folks, they had a sound. But then it talked about specifically, it said, but the old folks, the ancient ones, the older ones, said they had a different sound because they had something that they remembered. Through many dangers, toils, and snares. The, the ones that are standing, I want you to look and just say, look where he brought me from. I want you to tell the younger folks the only reason I'm still standing because of what I was standing on. I'm standing on right. I'm holding right. I'm walking with right. I'm loving right. Y'all preaching for me. David. See, a lot of them have tried different things. And then they found the right way. Drugs wasn't working. The man or the woman wasn't working. 
A lot of them have already been through that to where the one love they thought they had, that was their stay, that was their help, that was their foundation, they finally realized ain't but one that saved me. Ain't but one I'm leaning on now. Let me, y'all can sit down. <laughs> By some of y'all are looking and thinking about life and wondering who God's going to give you and looking towards the job to carry you through, looking for your education to carry you through. I can tell you there's only one thing you need. During the time, during the time of Saul, the kingdom of God got messed up. And the focus of the children of God deviated from God. Even you find that the king Saul forsook God and went to the witch of Endor for his answers. That would be like us consulting a Ouija board or a card or an astrology book. Or what's that thing called a horoscope for an answer? Why would a child of God ever look to anything but God for the answer? And because they forsook God, God forsook them. Even the sons of Eli, the sons of the priest, they forsook God so. And the Bible says that while one of the wives was having a child, the Bible says that she names him Ichabod. For Ichabod, Aleph-Inyad is the prefix. That means where there is snow in Hebrew. No what? Kabod or Kabod. No what? Kabod is glory. And the word Ichabod means there is no glory that the glory of God has departed from Israel that the light of God has just left his people and that's a shame when a child of God that God has saved finds himself walking in darkness and living in darkness and are without God in their life. There's hardly nothing I can think of worse than being in a backslidden condition because the backslider has already tasted that God is good. The backslider knows what it's like to have the presence of God. But to have had a relationship with God, a camp experience with God, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a place where you don't feel him anymore. You come and you know you're out of the will of God. 
And while others are praising God and others are feeling God, you're sitting there wondering, why are they so excited? Why are they shouting? And it is because of the presence of God in their life. But Israel left God and God left them. And the enemy carried the ark of God from Israel into their own land. The ark of God represented the presence of God. That ark, that chest, had in it the Ten Commandments. A memory of how God meets Moses in the mountain and gives him his law, gives him his word, and now, all of a sudden, the enemy has stolen that from the children of God. The ark of God had the manna of God in it. The manna was what? Was that angel food. When God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, and God caused food to rain down from heaven. He was showing them that whatever you need, I'll supply it. That even if you don't have food, I can make it rain food. And now all of a sudden, the enemy has stolen that too. And inside of the ark was the rod of Aaron. When Aaron and Moses was being contested by Korah and his folks, who say, you don't have no special calling on your life. We put on our pants one leg at a time just like you do. But when they meet, Aaron and Moses at the house of God and they lay their rods down and Aaron lays his rod down. God said, the rod that buds is the one I've chosen. But that was in the ark of God that the enemy stole. They had the Ten Commandments, the word of God. They had the manna which God provided for them, made a way. And then they had the rod that budded the calling of God. And the enemy took all of it away. Can you imagine that? That you had the word and the devil stole it from you. You had what God provided in the very thing God provided, the enemy stole it from you. You had an anointing on your life, a calling on your life, being used by God, and the enemy stole it from you. Hello? How would you feel if that was done to you and then God raises up David to be king. And David said, what the enemy took, we're about to get it back. Every blessing that God provided, we're going to get it back. The calling on our life that God had, we're getting it back. The word of God, the way I used to be able to preach and teach, quote scriptures, stand on the word of God, we're getting it back. Somebody say, let's get it back. Say it again, let's get it back. Look at your neighbor and say, everything the enemy stole. 
We're going to get it back. Give God a hand, pray. Gosh, I am. Hey, you may already have it back, but there's somebody sitting in the house who still has to get it back. Let's give God a praise because of the word coming to them, we're getting it back. The glory's coming back home. God's going to have glory in his house. Get that praise back. Get that shout back. Get that speaking in tongues back. Yeah, get it back, get it back, get it back. So David ascends to the throne. He's saying, I'm not happy with the ark of God not being here. So the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 13, he consulted with captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. The king calls a meeting. Every captain, every leader, we're about to have a meeting up here. <laughs> because I need everybody on the same page. I don't care if you're an usher, a Christian greeter. I don't care if you're a musician. I don't care if you're a bus driver. I don't care if you're a Sunday school teacher. We just call it a meeting. Everybody that works in some program here at this church, and God knows we got almost 30 of them. If you work in a program, tell your neighbor what program you work in. I'm going to give you a few seconds. The reason why they and David called the meeting and is saying to everybody in good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God. Let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere. Because what we're doing here is not going to stop here. David called a meeting with the captains and the leaders and then the whole congregation here and then said, now we're going to send out a message that's going to go all throughout the whole land. There's a message that's going out. Let's send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in the cities and suburbs that they may gather themselves unto us and let us bring again the ark of our God to us. Somebody say, the glory's coming back home. Because we need the presence of God to commune with God. And David then puts a coal in there for us. For the thing was right. Oh, where am I? Let me back up. Verse 3. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. 
I'm in verse 3, chapter 13, verse 3. <clears throat> the times of Saul being king. This is the saddest statement. One of them that I think I've ever read. That during the time of Saul, they didn't inquire at the presence of God for what they should do. There was no glory. The glory has departed. And so now Saul's running around, don't know what to do, how to do. And David said, not on my watch. We're not going to have to flip coins any longer. We're not going to have to draw lots any longer. We're going to have the presence of God so tough in this place that all we're going to have to do is just ask him and he's going to answer us. If we all get on the same page, all we got to do is ask him and he's going to answer us. So David, with a great idea, says to them, go get the ark. I want the Ten Commandments back. I want the manna that God provided back. I want the rod of Aaron that budded back. I want the presence of God back. I want the glory of God back. And in verse 7, they go up to bring up the ark of the Lord that dwelleth between the cherubim. And they carry the ark of God in a new cart. Y'all know the story. Be like carrying it in a limo. Carry it in a Hummer. Carry it in a gold-plated chariot. David's heart is right with God. I just want the presence of God. I just want the glory of God. And so he says, go get it. And they go to get it. And the Bible said they carried it in a new cart. Verse 7. David and all Israel played before God with all their might, was saying with harps, psalteries, timbers, cymbals, trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Shidon, the ark, it became unstable. And the ark is about to fall. And Uzzah, who's driving the cart, just reaches out to stabilize the ark because we want to bring this home. We want the glory of God back. We want to be able to inquire of God back in his place. And so as he's driving along, and hits a bump, he stops it from falling. And God struck him down dead. God, verse 10, got angry against Uzzah. If he had let him get away with that. Because we look at it and say, oh, that wasn't right, God. He was just trying to help. But 
But I hear the word of God say, you don't add to his word, and you don't take away from it. And if God had let him get away with that, then they could do anything else they would want to do with the ark of God and with the things of God. But God has a way, and God's way is right. And you don't have to make up stuff. And if you make up stuff, it will get you killed. If you make up stuff, it can take your soul to hell. But I don't see it like that. Who cares? You. God doesn't. He's not asking your opinion on the way to do his thing. He's saying, you've got to do it according to my word. And he got it angry that a man would have the audacity to reach his hand out and touch his ark when he was doing it all the way the wrong way and it was because he was doing it the wrong way that he had to stick his hand out to start with you don't help God You worship God. You praise God. You give God thanks. But you don't make up stuff and think God needs your help. I'll say it again. You don't make up stuff and think that God needs your help. God got angry. Because he put his hand to the ark. And the Bible said in verse 10, And there he died before God. God standing watching him. It's not like God was in heaven and he on earth and he just died because God has said that and God is somewhere doing something else. God is right there watching this man die. And David, him and God are on a different page. I was just trying to get the presence of God back. I was just trying to get the glory of God back. I was just trying to get closer to God so we can talk to him. Hmm. And the Bible said in verse 11, and David was displeased because the Lord made a breach. He's not happy with God. He's unhappy with God. <laughs> And verse 12 said, and he was afraid of God that day. I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know why God let this happen. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I don't know why things are not working out like I want them to work out. I'm bringing it home to 2018. I, I, I don't know why everything seems to be going wrong. And that's the dilemma that David has. I'm not getting this, and now I'm afraid of God. I thought I was doing something good, and now I got somebody killed. And they were just doing what I said to do. But from the pulpit to the 
door to the walls, to the floor, to the ceilings. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It only matters, does this line up with God's word? Well, I'm glad y'all can hear me. So David, like get this ark out of here. We're trying to bring it back to Jerusalem where God says it's supposed to be. But I don't want anything to do with that ark right now. And then in the presence of God that's on that ark, uh, I'm good with that being gone too for a while. And, and then they send it to the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And for three months, it's like everything Obed-Edom does just gets blessed. That, that's what the Bible said it, in verse 14, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. If Obed-Edom had a broken down car, he would go out and start it and it would run. If Obed-Edom had a washer and dryer that didn't work, all he got to do now is push the button because the presence of God is so tough in his house, it would work. If Obed Edom's wife or children were sick, all he had to do is pray to God and they would be healed because the presence of God was so tough in Obed Edom's house that everything that he had got blessed. And Dave is in Jerusalem. And here, man, Obed Edom's car started. Or whatever. Whatever he had. Obed Edom washing dryer dry works. Obed Edom's food is multiplying. Obed Edom got so much more money now and he didn't even work. He took a vacation and made money. Obed Edom, Obed Edom, Obed Edom, Obed Edom. Somebody say Obed Edom. And David's hearing about Obed Edom and David's mind is like, hmm changing the presence of God is working for Obed Edom have you ever seen somebody that's more blessed than what you are and you wonder what's going on and you know that you ain't where you should be and you just watch them get blessed get blessed get blessed and David's like Obed Edom Obed Edom I'm tired of hearing about Obed Edom being blessed <laughs> I wish somebody would get tired of hearing about Obed Edom when you're supposed to have the presence of God in your house. <laughs> Don't you want it back? <laughs> Don't you want to be blessed? <laughs> David made up in his mind, well, first time didn't work out real well, but I'm not going to leave that in Obed Edom's house. He ain't going to be the only one that gets blessed of God. It's coming back home. All of y'all, Israel, that meeting I called to get everybody on one accord, get back on one accord. The ark is coming home. The glory is coming back. What I used to feel, what I used to do, all of it. Is coming back. So now we're at the beginning, which is our end. Chapter 15. David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God. Keep in mind, let me, let me say this, that, that God was on David's side. 
that God was still in David's life. And all you have to do is look at the chapter before because he told him when you hear the sound in chapter 14 verse 15 going in the top of the mulberry trees then thou shalt go out to the battle for God is going forth before you this message don't take it wrong this is not a message just to backsliders this is a message to folks who still have God in their life David had that. But David said, but we don't have it like we used to have it. He's not being glorified like he used to be glorified in my house. Because there's one thing still missing. And I'm going to get that one thing and bring it home. So he started preparing his house to receive that one thing because I want more of God. He started preparing the house. And he said, verse 2, chapter 15, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. He says in verse 13, It was because you did not do it at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulder with staffs as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord first time we went we had a real good intention our heart was really good to bring the presence and glory of God back home to a level that we're on speaking terms with God and anything we ask him, he answers. But he says, the first time we didn't do it after the due, D-U-E, order. God's got a way to do it. And he said, we got to do it according to the word of the Lord that he's already given. <laughs> I'm going to close. I know where I wanted to go. Oh, my goodness. I wanted to talk about what David told Solomon. Why his children got blessed. But I'm going to close by here on this thought. <clears throat> I know why it didn't work out the first time. Because we didn't do it according to the way it's written. And when you don't, you start making up stuff. And then you get more and more off. Because you start associating what God does with stuff instead of with his word. If I'm lacking, what do I need to do? What do you think I should do, Ralph? What do you think I should do, Rod? What do you think I should do, Ryan? Or anybody else whose name starts with R on that first row. <laughs> I know Brother Harris. He asked Rod, Ralph and Ryan.
what should I do? Point me. Okay, that was for me. I almost went in on that one. What should I do? Point me. There's 31,102 verses. Point me. If you got that many verses, there have to be all kinds of solutions and answers. I shouldn't have to make up nothing when I got 66 books, 1,189 chapters, and 31,102 verses. I shouldn't have to make up a 31,103rd verse. Point me. I'm out. Somebody say, point me. to workers come quickly somebody today somebody here today wants some more of Jesus you've been there you've been in his presence you've rejoiced in his presence you love his presence but you realize you're not where you used to be Mmm. 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 Let me say this, family. You should feel like that every day you get up. God, point me in the direction you want me to go today. Teach me, O oh Lord, how to walk in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Hallelujah. Let me cleave to the word that you have spoken. Let me go after you one more day the way you want me to go. When I looked at this text as pastor was teaching, it wasn't that they didn't want his presence. Somehow, as he bought out, they thought they could get it some kind of other way. But don't let the enemy trick you today. Don't let the enemy deceive you today. He's already said what you need to do. Sanctify yourself. It's the Levi's that will carry. And don't go putting it on no cart. He said, carry it on your shoulders with the staves. Hallelujah. He didn't want them to do it any other way. He wanted them to do it the way he told them. And today, if you want God's presence for real, if you want more of him in your life for real, let, let me say this. Hold on for the music for just a second. Because so many people get confused just because you keep living. Just because the sun keeps rising and keeps setting doesn't mean you're okay. I know he didn't cause you to lose everything that he gave you, so you think you're okay. But this is a lesson about self-inventory. You ought to realize you don't feel him the way you used to. You ought to realize that you don't pray like you used to. That you're not calling on him the way you used to. That you're not excited about him the way you used to be. That you're not in love with him the way you used to be. Something has blocked you. And only you can make the decision. I want him back. And the only reason I lost it. Is because I let something of this life or the enemy take it away from me. But today I heard the word of God and I'm going to get it back. I'm going to get.
get him back. I'm going to get back in fellowship with him. I'm going to get excited about him again. I'm going after him like I once did. I realize that everybody don't understand what you used to have. And maybe you're surrounded by people who don't have an appetite for him no more than you do. And you might think that's okay, but I know a God who will remind you late in the midnight hours, uh, I miss you. Uh, I miss talking with you. Uh, I miss my time with you. Uh, I miss our fellowship. You can wait on somebody else if you want to, but you need to take inventory and don't get confused. Just because you keep inhaling and exhaling don't mean you're right with God. Uh, just because he doesn't strike us down doesn't mean we're right with him. He's not talking about you not wanting to be saved. He's talking about you getting where you're supposed to be. Get close. Get closer. Get closer. If you stay close, you won't come up with some man-made ways of doing stuff. Because he'll talk to you in the midnight hour. Hallelujah. He'll guide you. Hallelujah. He'll keep your mind. Hallelujah. He'll direct your path. Thank you, Jesus. He'll hear your cry. Oh, bless his name. When you stay close to him, you don't have to go running around looking for substitutes of anything. Because he is the fulfillment of your soul. In the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. You don't have to go looking for nothing else. I wish somebody who just wants a little bit more of him today. Inventory, inventory, self-inventory. Your husband can't judge for you. Your wife can't judge for you. You understand where you are. Somebody, somebody who just wants more of him. Who can say, God, I'm not happy when I don't talk to you every day. I'm not satisfied when I don't feel your presence. I wish everybody got hungry for Jesus. I, I, I wish everybody got hungry and understood that no matter how much you think you got, there's so much more of him you can't even contain him. Why are you satisfied with a cup full when you can have a basket full? Somebody come on at your seat. Hallelujah. Just begin to go after your God. Hallelujah. I want more, I want more, I want more. I want to be so full of you that even when my thoughts, my flesh rises up to fight me, I immediately recognize the enemy and I defeat him before I even get a chance to act upon it. Why? Because I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I Is there anybody who just wants more? More than what you got right now. More than what you got right now. I'm not talking to backsliders. Uh, but if you are a backslider, you're welcome to come home. Hallelujah to God. Uh, but I'm talking to some folks who say they love Jesus. Uh, how many here will say, I love Jesus? Uh, I love Jesus, but I want more. Every, every, everybody who wants more, come on and just begin to talk to them. If you need somebody to pray with you, come on up to the altar. Or you can pray at your seat. But come on and talk to Jesus today. Hallelujah.
not one thing do I wish more than I could just love you more. Lord, I just want to please you. Anybody remember when you told him that? Oh, it wasn't because you didn't want to be saved. It was because you did. And you said, I want to please you. Hallelujah. Somebody that's still in love with him, tell him not, not one thing. One thing do I wish for. Then, then I could just love you. Remember more. when you felt that way? I just want to please Jesus. You. I want you to know I am yours. Not one thing, not one thing. Not, not one thing do I wish for. Yes, I am. I am yours. I am yours. Everything. everything Remember when you told him that. Come on and get it back. Come on, get it back. I am yours. Don't let anything My steal your joy from so God. Hallelujah. Glory. I am yours. I am yours. 